Good evening, uh, members and guests. Namaste to all. Thank you for uh, joining us this evening uh, for an interaction with uh, Savita Shastri and her spouse A K Srikant. Uh, before we start the evening, uh, let me give you a brief uh, introduction of our speakers. Savita Shastri and uh, A K Srikant. have featured in media across the world as trend setters in the field of bharatnatyam today affectionately addressed as the dancing storyteller savita shastri had enthralled audiences across the globe for nearly 3 decades performing the traditional format of the bharatnatyam margam Her journey of rewriting the rule books of bharatnatyam by embarking on thematic presentations have moved audiences across the world so much that now critics recognize her as a person who has brought about a cultural revolution in bharatnatyam much as rukmini devi had in her age and time ak srikant the creator the writer director of uh, the productions which have taken the art world by storm starting from music within this duo has gifted us with soul cages yud the prophet and chains which have played over 100 shows in prestigious venues across the world after moving to the digital medium with descent in 2019 and several more productions Their latest is the trilogy based on the colors of the Indian flag. Now I am very consciously cutting short on uh, the introduction and their list of achievements so that we get more time interacting with the speakers. But uh, before we bring them to the forefront for the audience today, let me also show you a small uh, portion of their first digital production. it is available in youtube which is what i am going to share for you right now the descent that is the name of this production we will be talking about it uh, during the course of the evening as well but let us see a small snippet <laughs> the traditional format that is when you decided to take a firm decision and move away how difficult was the decision how difficult was the execution that's my question the decision i think was um was fraught with a lot of uh, um, a lot of thought on um on why is it that as a traditional dancer i was failing to make a mark in the manner that i thought i would so it actually evolved from you would almost say a sense of uh, failing um this was not something that i anticipated because when i started to you know re um enter the field of dance um, and i say re enter it's because i had taken a long uh, departure away from 
dancing itself. I had another career. And so it was much later in life that I uh, came back to dancing. And when that happened, the anticipation that I had was it would be seamless for me to just step in, um, yes, with you know, enough practice and with enough, um, you know, attention to technical prowess, I assumed that it would be easy enough for me to garner the audiences for what I did. And instead, what I found was uh, there was so much in the years that I started to visit Chennai or any of the cities across India for performances from the US, what I found was that um, there was a lot of availability on the, uh, you know, on the radar as far as entertainment was concerned. So therefore, dance itself took. Um, so for me to make a mark, um, I had to find a voice that one echoed what um, you know what I believed in, um, and still presented traditional dance um, in you know in its in its complete. Uh, in its completeness, uh, the way that I had learned it. So because I failed as a traditional dancer is what impelled us. In fact, he was where um, he was very pivotal in um, the decision to step away from it and do something different. And I say failed because the audiences wouldn't come to my show. And I take that as my failure. Um, most most of the time what would happen is that when I danced and I would see about 25, 30 people in the audience, um, there would be someone who would always come up to me and say, it doesn't matter how many come, it's the fact that they're there and you should just dance as though the audience you know, is brimming in the, uh, in, in the auditorium. And I always took it as that is not how cinema looks at it. If you have 10 or 20 people, we call that a box office flop, <laughs> right? So why is it that dance is not able to get that kind of attention? And I took that personally as a challenge. Um, I tried all that I knew within the realm of the traditional dance and it didn't work. So that's when Srikanth, coming from a very different world, he has uh, he's not a dancer. He um, has watched me go through those um, really hard years um, internalizing all of this as as my shortcoming and um, so he told me that maybe you really just as you look at cinema and wonder why you're not you know getting that kind of a response okay it would never be dance can never be cinema I understand that but at least a reasonable amount of response because you're only anticipating one auditorium to fill up not cinema halls across the country at least to that degree so he was the one that uh, that suggested that maybe you need to look at what cinema offers, which is every movie is about a different story. It's not as though all of us are dancing the same content. Even if I presented something on Devi or Rama or uh, you know um, any of our gods or goddesses, there is probably you know not that much of a unique perspective. We're all telling the same stories versus cinema saying a different story in each one of its um, you know, presentation. So he was the one that um, impelled me to move away from traditional dance in a, um, and start telling stories through um, that were based um, on what he wrote. These were uh, stories that uh, he's always been writing. But to take those stories and see if I could present them through the medium of dance. So dance becomes a medium rather than, um, you know, just um, when I used to do traditional dance, it used to be basically a checklist of, okay, she can sit in Aramandi, she can do Abhinaya, she can, you know, really um, uh, deliver it with a lot of expression, but the story was the same. So I was always being evaluated for how I presented it, not what the content was. So he wanted to place the content in the forefront, which is the story, and then have the delivery of it become a part of um, you know, part of the experience, which is dance becomes an experience that tells a story. Uh, so let me come to the second question, and I'm going this time to the creator. So after music within uh, the next story uh, was Soul Cages, the story of uh, a six-year-old girl who dies, goes to heaven, and then she prays for her family to join her. 
My question to you, sir, a completely different subject. Were you doubtful if this could be executed in the language of Bharatnatyam? Did you feel restricted while creating that story or while creating any stories that you do now as well? Thank you. Thank you for asking me that. I think when I write the stories, uh, they are not necessarily written in a view that this can be performed as Bharatanatyam or not. Uh, I write them uh, as I have to write them. And then the two of us go through an evaluation of the subject to see, can this be told through Bharatanatyam? A lot of what I write cannot be told through Bharatanatyam. Uh, what we do is a process called dance boarding. It's very similar to stage play or screenplay that you see in cinema, which is that we kind of try to tell the story, okay, these parts will go through dance, these parts will go through Abhinaya, uh, which is theatrics. And this is how we're gonna do it. Now in several cases, uh, I think it would make for a good play or a, or a good <clears throat> you know, talkie cinema. It may not be right for Bharatanatyam. So a lot of what I write gets dismissed off that way. Um, Soul Cages, however, was conceived because of um, um, certain experiences of my life. In fact, everything I write comes from either my life or her life or somebody that is very closely known to us. Um, so most of those stories are true in some sense. Um, so when Soul Cages was made, I think uh, I was fairly certain that the story would connect. And uh, you've got to remember that I wanted to take this dance form to those people that don't normally watch Bharatanatyam. And uh, I'm one of them myself. Under a normal circumstance, I probably would not be able to last a whole show, especially if it's a series of margams. Um, and I'm sure there are many others outside of the dance circles who are like that. Now, our idea was to take it to those people and tell them that, listen, classical Indian dance can be as interesting as anything else you're watching. <clears throat> so I think the aim was to target those kinds of people. And uh, with those kinds of people, I was sure that we would ring, the story would ring a bell. The doubt I had was would they, you know, the minute they hear Bharatanatyam, they'll say, Are you Madrasi dancing? And that kind of brings a curtain on the whole thing, right? So I was trying to see if we can get past that because they just dismiss it off with one word. You know, this is, this is, usual filter coffee stuff and they refuse to see the beauty that is behind it so i'm trying to say that listen give me a chance give me 15 minutes of your time and i will show you what the beauty of the classical art form is so i think my doubt was more on that not on whether the story would connect i mean i was very confident that the story would connect if, if that answers your question yes yes it does uh, my next question is again something on similar lines, but probably uh, to you, ma'am. Um, after that, we had Yudh, where we have Pavitra, and then Prophet uh, Devdatta, and Chase, where we have Vichitra. So Vichitra's uh, story is probably something uh, which the audience would be able to relate to. Um, maybe there are many members who came and in fact uh, told you as well, some part of Vichitra's life I have lived to. But a subject like profit, where you might need to handle it slightly, delicately, because an audience, uh, one, again, the Paratnatyam uh, window is there, and a subject like profit, how difficult was that for you? Um, yeah, it is <clears throat> certainly with uh, Vichitra. So in Chains, the um, story of Vichitra is told at three different stages of her life and um, you just see brief vignettes. And I think it was easy for anybody who um, had an ambition, who had a desire to do um, their bidding and then found that the circumstances around her, her family, her situation, all of those became um, so um, so critically, um, you know, so, so critical of her own choice that she couldn't um, she couldn't go after those. So it it is something that um, you know affects all of us. So it was easy to to find that um, uh, empathy across not just Indian audiences but across the world um, for that. Um, with profit, 
the response for profit and so in profit you have devadatta who um, who's had a very uh, very difficult childhood has had um, a journey where she um you know she has been abused um she has been um living a life where there was nothing inside except darkness and then one fine day she starts to hear a voice and this voice becomes her guiding principle guides her out of those periods of of um, of depressive loneliness and tells her what her next step has to be and so she starts to believe so deeply in this voice as the voice of god um and that voice takes her in her life to um to such great heights that uh, eventually she is regarded as um, as the prophet and when one day the voice tells her that she has only one year to live that's when everything starts to you know she starts to wonder if uh, if um, that uh, mortality that is facing her um, you know it it brings the one thing that uh, she never thought she had within her which is doubt doubt whether that voice was um, was indeed that of god or the doubt that she was true to god you know that is open to to the audience to understand and and how she deals with that in that last moments um is um, is what you see unfold in the in the work so it was not difficult as a story of a person who's gone through extreme um you know extreme um ups and downs in her life to be able to tell it um and to get that um you know to get the audience to go with us and in fact when we were presenting this in um in hyderabad uh, the uh, one of the audience members came to us and and they said uh, you know you had us in your palm the whole time believing that she was a prophet and at the very end you stopped and made us question it and so that idea of you know it is a story at the first um the the most important thing that i think uh, uh, is a take away for me from the years of work that i've done with him is if the story content is strong it is a beautiful story then the presentation of it um is um, as long as you don't detract away from it and start bringing attention to oh yeah let me bring this adavu or let me you know showcase what i can in dance then um, the story tells itself and it has the power to to hold um so it was the dance i felt was more um relevant as long as i as i uh, worked on the authenticity of you know being able to tell shri khan story honestly uh, and not detracting from it and the the impact of prophet was um, was as much um by way of a story as uh, vichitra was maybe it didn't have the same personal empathy but it certainly registered as a very powerful um you know narrative yes Uh, so what i'm going to do now is uh, since uh, we had decided to talk on digital uh, more this evening so i'm going to jump directly to your uh, the first uh, work that you've done online which is the descent a part of which uh, we saw a little earlier uh, so before you talk about the descent we'd also like to know why digital because the stories as well as uh, its interpretation and delivery were being accepted by audience and critics uh, you were traveling across the world as well why again a change in medium um do you want to start sure. that off sure um as i mentioned the last time i think the point of view we had was to take the stories to the uninitiated with the world of bharatanatyam if we were to do this on stage let's say in a year we are able to take these shows to 10 12 maybe 15 places an auditorium can fit in maybe 600 700 maximum 1000 people at the end of the year i've reached 15000 people with these productions that number you reach in digital in the first 15 minutes right okay. yes not all of them listen through the whole thing many of them have the forward button you know the phone is a funny device you lose their interest for a second they'll move on to something else 
having said which the you know the number of views you can generate on online um, through the digital media is probably far far higher so even if you take a small percentage of them actually watch the whole thing that's still much larger um, and then remember that as taking shows are concerned there are many countries where we may not be able to go as in you know there's Bharatanatyam followers as we've understood in countries I would have never imagined that people would look at a Bharatanatyam dance what normally people say is okay there's a circuit in USA where you go to New Jersey you go to San Jose you go to Dallas and that's the basic Carnatic circuit. Maybe in the UK, there'll be some ports, you know, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, the Middle East, and then there'll be one tour in Singapore. But the last thing you're going to do is go to Mongolia, go to South Korea, go to, I don't know, those kinds of places, right? We, we got comments from those. So if the idea was to take it to a wider audience, then it is imperative that you harness the power of the digital. It's foolish to ignore that. But you also have a caveat that on digital, the attention spans are far less than they would be when they're sitting in the auditorium. <clears throat> Therefore, your content has to be that much more powerful and that much better than you do it in the auditorium. So it was a new challenge to us. Fundamentally came from a small kid who was um, in one of her shows who talked to me and uh, the kid said that you guys are telling stories. It still takes 45 minutes to an hour to watch it. Can you tell a story in five minutes? We haven't done five minutes yet, but we've done about 15 minutes. So I'm hoping someday we'll get to five minutes. Attention spans are such. Yes, yes, very true. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's... Uh take up the uh, latest of uh, your series, which is the Colors Triology. And uh, I must first say congratulations. The latest uh, Saffron has won an award, the Best Music Director, and also nominated for two more awards. So congratulations on that first. Thank you. And uh, if you could uh, uh, probably let us know more about when you go into a digital production. Maybe we can take the case of uh, the Colors uh, Triology as well. Right from the idea to its final stages of conversion. So, because like we saw now, it is not just a dance film. It's fineness in music, camera, production. The entire craft has been given a lot of importance. There are multiple players involved, which is truly why it has been winning all these awards across the globe. So if you could please uh, tell us, or uh, maybe we could have a discussion on what all are the elements involved, what all are the stages that you go through in bringing out a digital product. Certainly, I think uh, we can both uh, chime in on that. Um, the start of everything is the story. And when Srikanth writes, um, he writes with, he sits down to write and he doesn't get up till the story is done. That's how he writes. Literally just one go. And that process of, um, of writing, he's not thinking about the, the conversion of it to dance. He's thinking about just telling the story. And I think that is very important. Um, he might be mulling over the topic, the subject for a while before that. So um, he's, He's working on um, on stories that I will discover, you know, in conversation before he writes it, and that really is, as I said, the um, guiding principle for everything that comes. So, if you were to think of it as a very large umbrella, that is what is first. So, once the story is written, um, I will read it, and that is the decision of whether it's going to make it to dance as a dance film. Uh, whether it was something that uh, would have never come to light as a dance production. So now that we've, we are only producing dance films, um, the, um, you know, there are uh, certain things that I look for. What are they? One is that it has to be able to passage stories through dance. Um, not all stories have an element that require dance um, or um, are uh, in concept so large and so complex that dance does not become a modality that you want to use in it. So it has to have um, 
it has to have that right mix of um, um, you know of uh, the narrative being um, there are certain emotions I look for, like there are certain things that have the the possibility of delivery to dance is very important. For instance, um, in uh, uh, the Colors trilogy, we had we had um, in the first part uh, emotions of um, frustration, of um, of um, exceeding, um, you know, uh, the sense of wanting to come out and um, to uh, seek something beyond what is available. So these are very easy for, for Nritta to capture. Um, to me, that element of Nritta capturing those emotions um, in the story um, is very important. So I look for, okay, what are the threads that I can use in dance to tell the story? Because a dance cannot be a pause factor, like an item number. What is an item number in Bollywood? It's not as though we haven't done it, right? So item numbers are just relief from the storytelling. Yes, um, you don't necessarily have to tell the story while the dance is still going on. But when I conceive of what the dance is in our dance films, to me, the dance is as much a part of the storytelling as the rest of it is, because that is what makes the dance film unique from a regular feature film. Right. And that is our forte. So um, unless there is that possibility of passaging story through dance, we will not take up his story. So once it's past that, then comes um, the other uh, segments. And I'll let Sri talk about the music. Hmm. So the music is obviously composed for the movie. It's an original piece of music that we get composed. Um, while we have some very talented and very extraordinary music directors we've worked with in the past, but it usually starts by my telling them that this is the mood we are seeking. And to that extent, I might play them samples of music and tell them that this is the mood I want, but it needs to be in Carnatic so that it can be danced. And um, the music composition, I think, is the single longest um, element of composing these movies. I think about 40% of the time taken to spend the whole, to make the whole film, 40% of the time would be going into getting the music right. And I've always told her that if the music is correct, then 50% of the job is done. Um, it is very mood based. Um, it has to deliver what we seek for that. And I do not find inspiration from one source. It comes from multiple sources as diverse as rock, hip hop, or uh, trans, Hindustani, Carnatic, Bollywood music even, as long as it gives me the right mood, I'm not hesitating to play it one way or the other. And I think my music directors have understood my eccentricities and um, have been kind enough to work with me through some very difficult demands I have where I tell them that you need to reduce the sadness of the song by 34%. Um, and things like that, which has become a common joke amongst my group. But uh, getting the music right, I think, is the most important part. And then we progress to other parts of it. Um, one other very important part of it that comes immediately after the music comes is the choreography, uh, which perhaps you are the best person because you she choreographs all the movies. Um, and I think that's the second biggest part. Once the music is set, once the story is set, then we get to the choreography. That's the next biggest part. Yeah, the choreography of, of the dance film, as I said, the dance is not a placeholder that you can just forward through and watch the film. The dance is part of the storytelling. And yet I don't want to use the gestural language of Bharatanatyam as, um, as the storytelling part. I want to use whole body language. I want to use Nritta. I want to use every part of of what we do as a uh, modality to tell the story. And in order to do that, I have to look at the movements um, in that same way. So if I were to take an Adava, I look at it as, okay, it has to tell the story of that character at that point of time. So every movement is steeped in emotion, um, in the way that, um, way that I see the song and the story progress through my body um, for that moment. That is uh, paramount when I choreograph. So the choreography is a process that um, will take 
you know, depending on, you know, usually short films, a, a month or a month and a half to two months. Um, and then we work it, rework it um, sometimes to, to fit in, um, fit in a particular location in terms of angles and because a camera sometimes is on top of me, is behind me, is, is in all sorts of directions. So um, we just look at um, how that part of the storytelling, because a camera is telling a story. Um, and to us, the camera telling the story should not take away um, what the, the uh, content is. It, it should not be about um, about finding a unique perspective through the lens, and and that's more important somehow than um, than the story itself. So everything is a subset of the story. The music is a subset. The dance is a subset. The camera work is a subset. So as long as I think we are following that, then the whole process has um, you know has a commonality and a way of coming together. They're all aligned. Um, in what we are uh, what we are presenting, so that I think is the key to the success of a dance film. Um, let the content speak. Um, don't get deluded into thinking that somehow, as a dancer, um, your moves and and what you are doing um, should be the highlight. For instance, if um, if you're doing um, a very fast section and and I start thinking, oh my God, um, you know, this this section is the highlight of the piece. You'd be surprised if it is not in sync with the story itself, it's going to stand out as absurd. So um, it has to all have a reason. If there is a fast section, there better be a reason for why it is there. If, if I've thrown in a panchanada in between something, then um, the panchanada cannot become larger than the story itself is what I'm trying to communicate. Right, it's it. It could be there um, for whatever reason that you've put in. In um, as long as it doesn't detract from the main main focus. So after the choreography comes, um, we sit and have detailed um, talks with um, with the uh, director of photography. Do you want to? Yeah. So we look for locations. Um, in most of these cases, we try to find natural locations because they're obviously cheaper to shoot in. Sometimes we've gone to studios. Studio time is expensive and we try to avoid it as far as possible, but sometimes the nature of the subject is such that it cannot be done outside. One word of caution here. I've seen several Bharatanatyam pieces from people these days on YouTube, which basically has them standing in front of some architectural ruins or the beach or some nice place and delivering a dance. But when I go through it, I see, okay, there's no reason for this to be have been danced on the beach or danced in front of this architecture, other than just giving a relief from the background. And so if there's no reason for you to be standing in front of a beach, please don't shoot it at the beach. If there's no reason to go and shoot it in front of architecture, please don't do it. You have to have that for a reason. If Karan Johar decided that Kajol and Shah Rukh Khan are going to look very nice sitting in... Uh, Mars, for example, do you think they'll shoot a scene in Mars? They won't. Every scene is there for a purpose. The background is there for a purpose and it has to serve the story. Otherwise, that scene shouldn't be there. Unfortunately, what I see most often, there is a, in fact, there's a video I saw a few weeks or months ago. There's a really sad tune playing. It's being shot in a Californian beach and the woman is grinning throughout the song. It, it was ludicrous. There's nothing connecting with each other. Why is she on a beach? Why is the music sad? And why is she smiling? Right? So it just doesn't add up. So as a person who's looking at dance forms from outside the cultural field that you guys are in, to me, it looks rather incongruent. So you've got to avoid a situation like that. Right? So we, once the locations are specified, of course, we come to the camera work. The cameras can be as in, inexpensive as your a very good phone camera. It can be as expensive as, you know, use Jimmy's and 70mm cameras and go the whole nine yards. Please look at the subject that you're shooting. Uh, you do not have to go for the most expensive equipment to make the best film. Uh, if you're telling a good story and you're telling it right, sometimes you could do it with an iPhone. You don't really need to go and hire yourself some cameras that have cost you the earth. Um, it's, it's untrue that a movie has to be 
made with a huge budget for it to be successful. The movie has to be made with a lot of common sense for it to be successful. Right? If the subject is such that it deserves a large canvas, by all means go for a large canvas. That's, that's the uh, one pointer I'd like to give on this. So at the end of which we edit it and then we show it to the audience members and if they like it, that's great. If they don't like it, we learn from it and we move them make the next movie. It's, uh, it's difficult to say that this will succeed or this will fail. For us, the effort is what matters. If audience don't connect with it, we learn from it, we move on. So don't expect your first digital film to get 1 million views and 50 awards. It won't. It takes time. There's a learning curve to it. And every movie turns out to be better than the previous one in that sense. Yeah, and, and I think what Srikant brings to the, you know, you heard him, he speaks very honestly. He speaks his heart. He comes from a field that is not dance. And I think it helps to have that, you know, to just sound your ideas to someone who's not even in the field, who, but someone who watches a lot of films or has, you know, or reads a lot or has, um, has a sense of storytelling. That is important. And because he's able to bring that to us, um, uh, sorry, there's some firecrackers going off. Um, because he's able to bring that honest voice and he's not afraid. He's not afraid of offending anybody. So he's not in the system of, of traditional dance where we have been told, this is the way. I mean, don't, if you step out of it, you're going to be ostracized. You're going to be criticized, but he's outside of the field. And so it allows, you know, sometimes I gasp like, how can you say that? But what I've learned is when I listen to him carefully, he's, he means for us to, to reach um, a platform, take Bharatanatyam to a place where it has not done so. You know, the reason why the trilogy has won 50 international awards and, and is continuing to win them um, across uh, every part of this world is, um, is because of that, you know, to be able to just take it out of the box of this is how you do it to let's see where we can go with it and, and really be honest about everything that's not working with the status quo. Sorry, it was a little long winded. No, no, we wanted that. <laughs> yes. Um, so um, um, maybe we can break uh, into a, a discussion with the audience as well. But uh, let me uh, just pose maybe two more questions. Uh, the first is, um, some of your works, for example, The Descent, and even today, uh, while you talked earlier about uh, switching to a thematic, you took it, uh, you said you took it as a personal failure. The subject of Descent, and similarly, I think the subject of Colors White, where uh, you felt boxed, uh, you had also mentioned it's like a certain autobiography. Yes. Uh, so, you have now danced it out, you have moved out of uh, your box but still does it does it still prick you that uh, there's always a constant attempt and trying to be different to consciously try to do it a different way it, does that always bother you that uh, i have to do it differently so that people view it differently um so the differently or the you know trying to tread a new path um it evolved over time right so when i was a traditional dancer i didn't know any better i thought this was all i had on the horizon and so i just kept doing that now that i am 10 years of or more than that about uh, 12 years after the the departure moving away it seems to be the most natural i mean the um, hand fits in the glove just so easily that um, i wouldn't even imagine going uh, back to traditional dance um, during the uh, the very first performance i still remember we both sort of said virtually like okay if this doesn't work if the first performance of soul cages was in kamani that if i get criticized for this then it is shutters because I've stepped out of tradition. I've moved into something else. Um, I remember our uh, music director, um, the entire um, crew that uh, worked with us, 
um, all of them looked at us as who are these newcomers? They're coming in and thinking they can change a field of uh, Bharatanatyam of traditional dance, right? So these are well-meaning people. Um, I'm not even talking about, um, you know, I'm not talking about uh, uh, Sabhas with uh, with that, uh, you know, very puritanical approach of only presenting margams. I've had many times when in the very initial stages, they have said, well, you know, we want somebody that can present a margam, right? So all of that has happened. And then you'll see flashes of that in white in my autobiographical telling. Um, so that was, I think, very, very initial in the first uh, couple of years of, of doing this. Um, as far as um, now, I, I wouldn't even know how to go back to traditional. I have come away so much that uh, this is what I believe uh, everybody does to almost, you know, to that degree, um, I feel this is all there is. What do you think, Shri? I, I, I don't think I'm the right guy to answer this because, uh, I mean, I was never a big follower of traditional. I still am not. <laughs> Um, I really don't know why I would go and spend one hour to look at a margam about how Krishna has been cheating on Radha about 50 times in a year. And why Radha doesn't do something about it is something I can't answer. But I think it used to get me very irritated. Not irritated because of the way it was done. It was irritating to me on two accounts. One, after you see all those performances, I came out thinking this Krishna is a total loser. Always seems to be cheating on women. That's all he seems to be doing. And then somebody explained, no, 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 no. This is one way God displays his affection to the millions. And one of them is this rasa and the other one is some other rasa. And I said, listen, I don't understand any of this. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And I often say this in lectures. If for a year, we only have one story. Hrithik Roshan is going to do it his way. Shahrukh is going to do it his way. Amitabh Bachchan is going to do it his way. The story is the same. Everybody is just performing it in different ways. Basically, you're trying to evaluate, okay, given this role, who did it the best? That to me is what classical Indian dance has become. But it's too beautiful an art form to be suppressed like this. And what drives me crazy is when we have something as beautiful as this, why are we killing it ourselves? Why aren't we letting the world know what we can do with it? Why are our own kids going and learning salsa and hip hop? Why aren't they looking at us? Because we are considered not so cool, as they call it. I think it's very cool. It's just that you've got to tell the right stories with it. right? If As long as you understand it's a tool to tell stories, it works. As long as it becomes an end in itself, then you have a problem. That's, that's from a non-dancer's point of view. Uh, a dancer's point of view, and this is always about, okay, when I do my Aramandi, how many inches from the ground am I sitting? And when I'm in a diagonal line, am I making a 45 degree angle? It sounds like mathematics to me, not art. Um, so somewhere I think that technique is carried to an extent which is so far that we forget why that program happened in the first place, um, which is my problem. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so while I'm going to open up for the audience to start shooting their questions, um, you can either choose to unmute or you can type in the chat as well. Uh, while they uh, pick up their question, maybe my, uh, my final question to the two of you. Uh, like you've been very honest, so I'm going to ask both sides of the coin. Which is the best compliment and which is the worst one also you've received for your digital productions? <laughs> the worst one in the sense that uh, uh, the one which wasn't uh, very uh, comfortable to hear. Maybe we can take it as a positive later work on it, but it wasn't very comfortable. Mm. Well, well it's interesting that you should bring this up, right? For the, for the longest time, she used to always say, the comment that you don't want to ever listen to is, that was nice, Akka. And he would always say, what does that mean? That was nice, Akka means nothing. There is no emotional investment in it. Give me an honest comment that says, you know, I, I really did not like it because of this and this and that, right? Um, at least you've evoked some emotion, 
rather than a placid lukewarm that was nice. So I'm just professing it. So I think we've definitely moved away from that yeah, was yeah. nice. Nobody Very says, far away. Nobody says nobody that. Nobody says, Akta, that was nice. Some of them hate it. Prophet had the audiences polarized very sharply. Some of them think it's our best work. Some of yeah. them had unspeakable things to say about it because it has subjects which are not usually seen in classical dance. But I would not consider that to be something negative. If somebody saw the whole performance and then just said, yeah, it was okay, you know, that would probably hurt me the most. Fortunately, we've not had that, or maybe nobody's told us that. <laughs> maybe they do think that, I don't know. Um, but nobody's told us that yet. But the minute someone says that, yeah, we saw your colors trilogy, it was okay. Yeah, good, good, good job. I mean, that would probably hurt me a lot. If someone came and said that, you know, what shit have you made? I mean, I couldn't, I just don't get it. Huh? Then I've evoked some, then, then I'm okay with that. Or if they say it was fantastic, that's great. So that, that in-between path is what, you know, when she used to dance traditional, I used to be the announcer on stage. So I would stand on the side when at the end, those, those people would come up and say, Akka, that was so nice. Thank you so much. Evening, we're meeting for coffee in Radha Krishna Salai. Can you come there? So nice. Such a nice sari. Such pretty flowers you're wearing. I used to be, what shit was all this? <laughs> for this, we traveled all the way from US to come here to dance. Uh, that would probably have hurt me the most. Yeah, luckily that's not happening. The day that happens, you'll we'll stop making movies. <laughs> so let me open up to questions. Uh, there isn't a question yet on chat, uh, but please feel free to unmute yourself. Uh. Reshma, I am waiting. Yes, Hi, Ramanya, ma go ahead. Okay. Uh, but I have to say, it was nice hearing you. It was not satirical. It was really meaning what it, <laughs> it has to mean. Um, so <clears throat> the thing is, uh, you know, like uh, this is a very different kind of uh, presentation that I've heard today. Uh, no PPT and it's life experiences. The thing is, I have so many questions that uh, it would probably become an interview. But uh, let me uh, prioritize my questions and ask you the, the first one. Um, do you... Uh, like train your train students or do you do solo? I have not watched. I'm so sorry. I've not watched any of your performances so far. Let me be very honest with you. So do you uh, have a group of students and then you perform along with them or do you do solo? Um, great, Lavanya. I'm glad, um, you know, perhaps this will inspire you to go watch something um, that I've done. Um, the uh, Student part of it, uh, right now, I have uh, one student who's in my Gurukula that I train. Um, the only modality that I use to train is if the student lives with me and uh, trains um, in an immersive uh, manner, because my work is such that there is always the next project. And um, uh, so it's easier for me to um, not not detract from it and yet be able to give to students who are um, who are willing to take it on um, this road. And I see this as the road uh, less traveled and it's not an easy road and it takes it takes that much. Um, so the one hour of class two or three times a week is not something that I feel will prepare students for uh, this kind of challenge. So I'm looking, I'm always looking for students who have that kind of commitment, who want to tread um, the alternate route. And so the presentations themselves, if I need dancers, then I recruit dancers. So and, and they will go through a training with me, obviously, for the project itself. Um, uh, the um, story will call for that. Um, if it does, then I just find dancers. Excellent, ma'am. Excellent. Yeah, that was actually, you know, that's where I was like, we are all training the uh, students. Uh, you know, it's a traditional, very methodical way of uh, and then I hear something ab absolutely different. I'm like, okay, there is something to explore, but how am I to go there? That the thirst is always there. Right. I understand the difficulties that you have. It's it's really challenging. Even, uh, sorry, uh, yesterday, you know, I have, have to pick up a song and I picked up one Krishna song. 
and uh, as sir rightly pointed out okay what is Chris, krishna doing with uh, because that's what i could uh, take and that's what i could easily plug in it's not like uh, going beyond and then uh, you know uh, music and all those things it was amazing amazing listening to you both uh, in fact we have we are a strange we are a similar combination my husband is totally uh, away from dance and then uh, you know and whenever he he says something how am i to comprehend that is a big question for me because whatever i am rooted to is not whatever he is saying so i i think i got more of uh, ima- i could imagine how your life would have been uh, should have been a conscious or a really conflicting ideas coming up it's it's amazing thank you uh, i don't want to take much of your time i've already taken a lot thank you thank you lavin thank you we have a question on chat this is from sunita shivdas um uh, sindhu sorry if i can go with this first and then we will yeah, yeah, to you yeah 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 okay uh, so the question is uh, natya shastra is accepted as an authority of indian classical dances according to you does natya shastra only accept a traditional margam on indian gods or is there scope for new themes and creativity <laughs> see the i i i think i i have to uh, put a disclaimer here i am probably the the last person as a theoretician to expound on um, on the natya shastra or any of its allied texts and i say this very humbly and i mean it with all honesty that uh, i see myself as a performing artist and i know my craft and i know bharatanatyam because um, because of the amount of effort that i have taken to understand it not from the perspective of theory at all but really from the perspective of only one thing that matters to me does my audience register this classical dance as important enough to not scroll through and watch something else or leave their seat and look at the phone or do something um, different while they're in my stage or auditorium um why is that important because the audience is all that matters to me i dance because my audience is there so having said that if the natya shastra is saying something then in what <clears throat> in what manner does it need to affect me only in the manner that i present bharatanatyam the way that the adava structure is the geometry is um everything else as far as you know what should be what could be um the limitations of it this was written when you know at a time when um obviously the digital world was not anywhere present or even the kinds of uh, you know the reason for art was different um now it's not the only kind of art that is available there is so much you're in competition with everything else so you have to draw from other fields and see what will place your art at the forefront given the times that you are operating in to live in that cocoon of well i'm only going to do what the natya shastra suggests means you are limiting yourself because you don't live in those times anymore you are in competition with cinema you are in competition with netflix you have to react and respond to that you are looking at a world where uh, classical dance is not regarded as a source of you know evening let's watch bharatanatyam it's not regarded as your is a, as even anywhere close to um, you know the the top 10 things you would want to do on a uh, saturday evening right on an average for an average audience so how do you respond to it um and to me um as long as you're authentic to the dance form itself um you know i'm not suggesting that you move away from bharatanatyam and and suddenly start incorporating hip hop moves or something flashy stay with the with the movements of bharatanatyam but um i have walked away from the natya shastra from all of the limitations that i see that are dictating what i should do how i should do it um beyond the form of the dance itself Uh, Sindhu, <coughs> we can have your question, please. Namaste, Akka. Namaste. 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 Yeah, I'm from Chennai. I'm all. I'm an actor and also a Bharatanatyam practitioner. Uh, feels great to 
uh, get the opportunity to interact with you in live. And uh, my few questions is that you just now answered to Lavanya that uh, uh, you have a student who uh, have in a Gurukula system where you teach. So I was just wondering, uh, your system of teaching will be entirely depending on, uh, I mean, it will be uh, different from the traditional way of uh, uh, the pattern of how we teach Bharatanatyam usually? Yes. The Tattadavu, Nattadavu, all of those are just the very beginning of, um, of training. So those I see as um, just barely skimming the space. To me, it is important why an Adavu is presented um, in any um, in choreography. So for that, I need to transcend the, the movement of the Adavu itself and look at it as a canvas for, for uh, telling for telling um, the mood of the song. So the Adava is only the <clears throat> basic, it's probably lesson, uh, you know, 101 in a, on a scale of, uh, you know, uh, a lot that has to progress. So how do I do that? Um, in a Gurukula system, there's a lot of um, choreography. So every day, virtually, there will be some choreography that is going on where we are looking at the mood of the song and we are creating pieces that truly reflect it. Um, so the the way I, I look at dance is we are, uh, you know, there is work that we do with technique and why you're not able to to tell the story with that adava is because the technique sometimes becomes limiting. So we work on, okay, so if you're not able to tell that story with just one adava, two adavas, right? Um, then we need to go fix those parts of your body. So then there is a whole system of exercises that we're working on that will allow you to tell that story with that um, adava. So that to me, to you know, in a nutshell is the approach. Um, there's of course, the whole immersive process of being part of these dance films. So they are able to be there for every segment of, of how we create it and participate in it. And so there is, uh, you know, what I'm hoping through the Gurukula system is to, to be able to channel not just dancers, but to create artists who can make their own dance films. So that is the venture. Okay. Thank you for that. One more question. I was just wondering uh, for the who usually produces your movies? It is you yourself become the producers or there are sponsors who pitch in to do that because uh, economy is one thing that we <laughs> are always uh, faced, you know, that's the um, ugly truth where we are to stand upon. Yeah. Yeah, so I was just wondering if you could share about that too. Well, in our case, we produce our own stuff. I'm the producer. Okay. Um, having said which, we've also cold called on producers. We've also cold called on people. I'm talking 14, 15 years ago. Um, we've gone, I've, I and she have gone the roads of Trivandrum, Chennai, knocking on doors of producers. Will you please help us put this show up? I used to go with her because sometimes she would get very weird looks from those producers. Um, so when I started going with her, then uh, luckily that part of it was filtered out. Um, Yes, it is. Uh, I wouldn't call it ugly. I would say it's a necessary thing. It's a necessary evil. You've got to convince them why they should put their money behind something that you're doing. Um, but yes, there are ways of, uh, and there are, there are entrepreneurs who are willing to put in their money. There are, uh, I think, government aid that you get sometimes. In a lot of ways, I would advise people to try and minimize the cost of production and see what you can do yourself. You do not have to take it to those places where to make a YouTube video, you have to spend lakhs and two lakhs and all that. There are ways of doing this effectively. Even with the most basic equipment you have at home, start with that. You have a lot of copyright free music that's available yeah. on YouTube. Start with those. You know, you'll have to do a bit of searching to find the right music. Take a four or five minute piece. See if you can tell a story through that. Have your brother or your husband shoot you through a camera. Uh, see how creative you can get with that, right? Once you have a network of these available, you'll get some people interested in you also. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes, it takes, it takes a bit. time. It, it takes a bit of time. I remember when we first started it and it didn't, you know, we didn't get into this production uh, directly. We, we started very small ourselves. We look at 
our initial productions to where we are today, you, I mean, you will see that progress. So he, um, he quoted Anurag Kashyap, um, who, um, who said that you really can make a movie on a shoestring budget. Just take your camera, get on the road. If you have a good story, the story will tell itself. Right? There are, there are in uh, all of the the international film festivals that we've uh, um, we've uh, been um, you know awarded. There's always a category that has an iPhone or a phone, phone a phone movie, yeah. right? And you get awards for those as well. So it's the budget should not limit you. Yes. Um, yeah, the descent, the, the scene you saw on the hill, for example, that's a, that's there near Ramanagaram, near Bangalore. Uh, we didn't pay to use that location; it's no. free. It's there for anybody to use. We, in fact, for that particular thing, used a Nikon DSLR camera, which could record video. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's all it was. Uh, although it looks really nice on screen today, what we spent on that was actually very minimal. Because it was going on location, we had in fact gone to the location which was where Shole was shot, which involved a fair bit of climbing, and we wanted something where we could go in and uh, get out, get Just in and get shoot out, and get shoot out. and get out. Right. Uh, and honestly, we didn't anticipate that it would end up being so remarkable. Yeah, um, but it was done on a shoestring budget, is what I'm yes. saying. Is that you do not have to spend those lakhs to do a descent. The movie, which is there on YouTube, was actually made on a shoestring budget. Yeah. So it, it reuses a very normal camera, which you probably have at home. The location is available for all to shoot. Just keep your eyes open. Go with your husband, brother, girl, you know, boyfriend on a ride. Take your car out of the city. You'll find several spots. She and I do that all the time. If nothing works, we drink coffee and have a masala dosa and come back. Yeah. Yeah. So we do that all the time. Right. And on the other end, you have Saffron, which has all kinds of equipment that was used, uh, jimmies and rigs and, and, and really state of the art cameras that have movie cameras. So huh. it's, it's the entire spectrum. That is the that other have. end of the spectrum where we engaged a studio, we engaged 4K ultra high definition cameras and, it, you know, it, it can be this or that or anything in between, but Saffron needed that because the subject was such. Descent did not need that because the subject was such. So if you're starting off with this and gaining the interest of possible entrepreneurs who are willing to support you, then I think start making by four or five minute pieces and tell something remarkable using that. You don't need high equipment. You need a lot of good sense. Keep yourself in the background. Let the story be told. Yeah. Don't keep looking at yourself and saying, look how, I'm, how good I am doing this. Because while you think that, the others get very irritated with that. Think about it. If someone keeps coming in front of you and saying, look how well I'm doing this, after a while you'll say, okay, yeah, that's fine. Just sit down. Right. So start with that, you'll get interest. People will take notice of you. Descent won its first award at the Calcutta Cult Film Festival. I didn't even know such a thing existed till I got a call from them. And I was like, I thought it was a joke, actually. But they've actually seen it and they, well, it, that was the starting point. So I'm always grateful to Calcutta for having recognized it first. It's strange that when we actually took Soul Cages to Calcutta in its first tour, that was the biggest flop amongst a series of 13 shows. Hardly anyone attended it. And then people told me Rabindra Sangeet is the only thing that sells there. People don't see Bharatanatyam. But look what happened. They were the first ones to award Descent 14 years later. Yeah, and and today I'm I'm you know I'm proud to share with you that uh, the journey that uh, this you know we were inspired by Anurag Kashyap and 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 he was um, he was the juror um, in Pune, one of Pune, in Pune, Film Festival. Pune Film Festival and uh, the two films that were the finalists were both ours. Colors white versus colors saffron, so, and it was adjudicated by Anurag, Anurag Kashyap, Kashyap himself, who actually so. was our inspiration to start off on this to begin with. It's just a strange work of fate that it came back to him in the end. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It's really inspirational. Maybe we should all try doing. <laughs> please, please bring your camera. And please do. We play a game where I play some music which she doesn't know what I'm going to play. And she has to act out that in Bharatanatyam. I could play anything. And in fact, her student also joins in sometimes in our fun games. 
Uh, we just switch off and keep minimal lights and then they're free to do what they want, but it has to make sense. And this actually has turned out to be something, not only as a game, but it, it's become so instrumental to the choreographies we do. I could play an old Hindi song and say, okay, emote to those now. Use Bharatanatyam and do it. Or rock or trance. Or rock, or trance, whatever. And she can, I mean, today I think there's nothing she can't dance to. Even if I played the news, she could probably dance to that. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but that's a game we play. So it, it's, these are the ways we developed and we still do it. Yeah. Thank you. Very inspiring. Very inspiring. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a long, hard journey, but I'm happy it's getting somewhere. If there are other people in the audience who want to make something and send it over to us, we'd be very happy to give you our comments on what looks right or wrong so please feel free to um, send us your work no matter how rudimentary it is um, it would be good if Bharatanatyam started becoming the most viewed item and not some stupid Bollywood dance that people learn in half an hour and put it up when classical dancers actually spend 18 years to learn that 20 years to learn that let's use it for the right things now what are we doing with it yeah, and likewise, if there are students who want to be part of the dance films, I'm happy to, the only requirement is, of course, the presence in Bangalore for rehearsals, because that's, this is where I work out of. Please, we want more, more, to, more students to benefit from it and also be, uh, uh, take it up and, and have the possibility of success. That was my that next was question and you answered that. I don't know if you see Hello. Uh, we, we say that poo order say the narum manakum, like that, you know, like of all the good work you have done, being part of it will uh, enable us to be something. Oh, no, I, it, it's, it's a matter of, you know, great pride that uh, I have to say that when, uh, when I look at a student uh, taking on these challenges and, and doing better than me, it's, it's just gives me so much joy. It truly does. And I, I want to see that. Um, I really believe that Bharatanatyam has that uh, power and we just are not using it in the manner that uh, it, it really could showcase stories. Namaskaram, ma'am. Namaskaram. Yeah, my name is Chitra. Yeah. So I just wanted to know, so ma'am, uh, if you want to like you know select a student so you have some criteria for that or like you take from beginners also for beginners also so the story demands uh, the kind of dancer that i need for a production a film and uh, because it's a quick in and out right um, if you're talking about a student as in a uh, student for the gurukula are you talking about student for uh, for the dance film kana uh, so, ma'am, uh, normal, normal. If a normal student wants to, you know, do basic training from you, so like, how you go about it? Like, not right. for a production or anything, but uh, su suppose, like, you know, I want to learn from the basics, like, you know. So, how you go about it? Do you huh. start from the basics. Um, so I don't have any issues with taking on a student, um who's willing to be part of the Gurukula system. If you're living in Bangalore, obviously that would be the first requirement because I teach and live in Bangalore. So, um, and it's perfectly fine if you don't live with me. My students, the, the students I've had in the Gurukulam have lived with me. And um, Varsha, who, um, uh, who's here, uh, um, also lives with me. But it's not a requirement. You could be in Bangalore, but spend most of your day because they all started like that with me. They spent most of their day with me. And then eventually the after the pandemic, they started living with me. So you could spend your, you know, your um, most of your day working with me. I have no issues with what level you come in with, because regardless of where you come in, you have to embrace the, the system. Um, so that is not a problem. It is usually the issue with uh, commitment. Um, being full-time dancer um, and uh, we do pay a stipend because I know that this is you know this is not possible without without some kind of support dance is an industry which uh, unfortunately um, 
is a very difficult place to be to justify yourself as young girls taking on dance in lieu of whatever your academic background is. Uh, these students who have come to me, who've lived in the Gurukulam, have had alternate careers that they have given up. Um, so I understand that there are certain financial pressures. And so we do extend a minimum, you know, a stipend so that you can at least uh, support yourself. Um, and uh, so that is, um, uh, is how I, I operate. Yeah, so ma'am, that uh, helps you to understand the student in and out, I guess. Like, that's a, uh, that's where the comfort level, you know, to understand a student better. Like, uh, nowadays, this one-hour class and the kids are just looking at the time, like, you know, when is the class getting over? And so, like, this is, I think, yeah, uh, the students also can get deeper into what they are learning. They will understand what they are doing. So, I think, yeah, it's a commendable job, ma'am. Thanks a lot, yeah. Thank you. Good. Uh, we have a few comments on chat. A uh, lot of people saying thank you uh, for the inspirable words which make young classical dancers to do something more and different. Uh, there's Radhika who says, very interesting session. Enjoyed listening to the inspirational talk. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? Uh, Ma'am, is it possible for you to organize workshops in uh, uh, major cities? Because we have got members from all over the world. So, uh, and they have got their own organizations. So, is it possible for you to conduct uh, a one-way workshop, of four days or five days, a one-week one workshop in uh, their, their cities? Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, dance in the digital era is, is a three-day workshop that uh, both Srikant and I have felt would really be something that uh, can influence and inspire students in, in today's world. And uh, more than happy to have organizers reach out to me. Um, my, um, my contact is on my website. I'm happy to do, um, you know, these are, um, these are activities that give us both great amounts of joy. Um, it is for, for sharing our art that we work very hard. So anything that will make it easier for students and give a shortcut so they don't have to work as hard. Um, just, you know, a lot of uh, commonsensical things that we've learned over the process of doing this. We are happy to share anytime. We would like you to be a part of the organization so that uh, uh, we, we could spread the message that you are organizing these programs and workshops so that uh, it will be a great thing because... Uh, uh, we have got uh, so much of members in every place and they would like to organize uh, many events. And also I would like to ask you another thing. Is there any, uh, any OTT platforms, uh, successful OTT platforms where classical dancers can perform and earn money? <laughs> <laughs> earn yeah. money is the biggest problem, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. If your video gets sufficient number of views, you can monetize videos on YouTube. We don't do that, but there is a way, there is a way of doing that. If you have a US account in Amazon, you can distribute your movies for free on their account. Uh, it would be featured on OTT. If it gets enough views, you, can, you could get money on that. Of course, it needs to get enough views for that. Um, the, there are certain other websites which promote your video for you. Please be very careful before you send your videos out to such websites. Many of them are fraudulent, yeah. but there are a few genuine ones which can promote your videos. Um, my other request is never ever try to gain views by, uh, you know, paying some vendors for it because that could end up blocking your account and certainly uh, become a big issue going forward. Um, given the clutter of everything that's available on YouTube, and it's not just dance, I mean, there's many, many other things that are available on YouTube. If you get a million plus views is when you can safely think of monetizing uh, something on it. Uh, it's a long process. It's a very long process to get there. 
it's uh, you just have to keep putting out content in the digital space and if collectively you start if you're good enough and people are actually viewing it and your views are increasing over a period of time um, there is a way of monetizing it it's a very long-term process it's not something that can be got in a day or two um, so unfortunately the answer for can i make money out of putting this on the ott platform would 99.999% of the time is a very, very long process. It's not something that will happen overnight unless you've created something so sensational that you've you've just beaten the Ranbir Singhs and Ranbir Kapoor's of the world and created something. That happens one in a million, right? It doesn't happen all the time. So there is the Instagram route, right? There is the, we don't have TikTok in India, but to be an influencer. So there's two kinds of people on, on these platforms. There You have the influencers, and then you have the artists. Your influencers may or may not be artists at, um, you know, that crossover is not necessary. So the influencer is uh, typically someone who is young, who has the charisma, who's able to get branding um, for what they put up. Um, that is the world we live in. And it is possible through that for, um, for people to get it. You don't necessarily have to be a classical dancer at all. Um, classical dance by itself has only a limited number of audiences, but that is a route that you you can use to to gain uh, traction to your persona, um, at least for a certain period of uh, of life while you are honing your artistic skills. But be very realistic that that is not art. Thirty seconds on Instagram or uh, fifteen seconds on TikTok is not art. It is an influencer's position that you're using to gain traction to who you are and that is legitimate there is nothing you know um, i don't condone it as uh, oh my god why would you do that well that's the world you live in okay so that brings a good amount of attention as well as branding in india it's less so it hasn't happened to that degree but certainly in the in the west um, dance is become a huge uh, portal through tiktok and people are making a lot of money through those little 15 second videos through branding and, and you know, just positioning themselves there. So it's a matter of time before, uh, before something like that breaks through. Um, however, the dance films that we are putting up is, is not in that, you know, it's not in that realm. So if you are looking to be an artist that can only bring in the money so that you can actually do some, some work with it. Um, that goes extends beyond this this little capsule that you're supposed to give out um, just to grab attention, right? It's a different kind of work. If Amazon or Netflix or Sony or any other uh, OTT platform uh, takes up uh, uh, classical dancers to promote the art form, it would be very good. But there is a there is a platform called SSWLE Chalet.com. Uh, are you familiar with that? Yeah. Um, I've seen some performances through that. Um, the, the problem where, I mean, the main thing is that classical dance, even in the Western world, does not have the same audience, you see. So even classical dance in the Western world struggles. The You know, I've, I've been part of the San Francisco Bay Area community, and I know how, how difficult it is for organizations there to, to find the funding as well. So this is a this is across the world. Um, unless you come from a school um, that has a long-standing reputation, um, the Royal Ballet or you know those kinds of institutions that have sponsors and and uh, uh, just the the um, uh, the name associated with it will will um, get those sponsors to to give money. Unless you get those sorts of institutional uh, you know, support. It's difficult as individuals to to get and gain sponsorship to that degree, so um, it's it's unfortunate. And classical dance, by nature, does not have the same attention grabbing uh, ability as um, as other forms of entertainment. So um, we have to live within that realistic expectation um, and try and see how to break out of it to the degree possible. Um, uh, these are uh, you know. This is what we've uh, sort of learned to be realistic about our um, our expectations. That is important. Thank you. Well said, ma'am, because we don't have audience at all. Uh, we take our kids to the small, small temple presentations uh, where no, not even the, their parents are viewing their child's dance. Hmm. That's, the, that's the hard truth. But 
as uh, shrikant sir spoke <laughs> probably it's what we are conveying is not that appealing yeah. to the audience so that was a good take away from your session thank you so much any other questions that anybody might have mm-hmm. well if you think up of some questions later please feel free to write to us we'll be happy to take them sometimes you know when you're in the session it doesn't come to you and the next day you Absolutely. think that i wish i had asked this um if something like that does come up please do write to us yeah savitashastri.com you can reach uh, you know me through it or uh, through instagram uh, please feel free to write to us and we'll be happy to we don't have any barriers everything that we have learned we are happy to share the path um the resources whatever we can so others um, can do such work yeah yeah uh, that's that's very clear if you have an interesting story to tell and if you want to know how to go about this uh we can help if you need our help that is um i would never want anybody to go down to sleazy sabha secretaries begging them for a chance uh, where they look up look you up and down like it happened in her case and in so many other cases um for all the classicalness that we try to promote the world is quite sick sometimes and uh, by now your audience must have guessed that i kind of speak my mind so um i trust you don't take offense at what i'm saying uh, but that is the truth and that is the truth as i experienced it through her 15 years ago absolutely true though i stand next to you know in terms of line i stand next to your wife because she whatever she has gone through uh, in, including the break i have gone through and then i know how difficult it is and yes. i'm i'm absolutely with you in whatever so, you're saying so unfortunately the casting culture as we call it is prevalent the world over uh, regardless of what you're trying to take to get into the public eye which it should not be but it is right the digital is a cool way out of that problem because you are actually circumventing that whole lot um another reason why you should go digital by the way i never thought of this before i just thought of it. right absolutely yeah. right so um please feel free to write in to us at uh, if at any point we could be of any help that would be great and i know we've gone over your time ma'am but uh, i trust the producers definitely in fact if we have time for more questions i think uh, we should stay on sure sure <clears throat> nobody has say question yeah, can we wind up uh, we yeah. can uh, because uh, oh, yeah, yeah. please feel free to uh, google up uh, not not just google please also do go to youtube uh, like uh, savita shastri had mentioned all the digital works are available for everyone to view and uh, we also probably missed ma'am to mention the inner circle uh, if you would want to take a minute please we can do that as well so for those of you that um, you know live outside of bangalore and want to reach into ways of uh, improving your technique or maybe journeying up to the level of the production the inner circle is my vision to be um, able to deliver that fully free of course there's no um, there's no cost associated with it at all either for registration or for using its content and there are videos um on every aspect of how we start from technique all the way to production um it's an ongoing you know library that um, i keep adding resources to so to become a member you just need to go on my website again savitashastri.com and there's a tab for the inner circle just fill in a few things that uh, will allow you to become part of it and i hold classes master classes um once you know every couple of months for uh, for its members um on all kinds of topics so these are also free so all of this is uh, available uh, to anyone that wants to look at dance and and see um you know follow a different path um and understand uh, what the options are um and if you don't want to do that there are a lot of technique videos that just look at how to improve your uh, dance technique 
Thank you so much for that as well, ma'am. Uh, and Gopakumar sir, uh, we can yeah. wrap yeah. for today. So thank you very if much, I... ma'am. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Savita and uh, Srikanth. Uh, it is uh, it was an excellent session. It was really extraordinary, and uh, we. ICDA would like to support you in all the activities, and our members would like to uh, organize your workshops and organize uh, whatever programs, you, even your performances in uh, major cities. And we will always be with you. And we would also uh, request to be part of our organization so that you can give us more ideas. So uh, since we have got so many members, uh, the, the lot of things could be done from our side. And uh, even speak mckay and organization like surya uh, were appreciating us because we have got so much of programs happening uh, nowadays and uh, uh, on through uh, now online and now after the pandemic period every will be will be active uh, live programs also so uh, again i would like to thank savita and srikant for this excellent session and also uh, reshma george for the hosting of this session thank you very much thank you thank you all friends who joined this program thank you thank you ma'am i have registered in your inner circle wonderful you'll get your approval within 24 hours thank you looking forward to connecting with you It's pleasure pleasure talking to you he is our coordinator from usa lavanya shivram yeah wonderful lavanya nice to meet you, you this forum thank you um, thank you so thank you sir uh, thank you reshma it's um, it's been wonderful to be part of this community um there is uh, always uh, you know somebody that is on the horizon who's speaking up for dance who's getting people together and sharing it um in this manner and and um sequestering people like us uh, into that forum and it's it's a joy that uh, you know you would take your time uh, and put in this kind of effort and we are delighted and honored to be a part of um, part of your organization and this um, outreach that you've um, that you've so generously shared with everybody thank you thank you so much ma'am thank you sir and uh, good good night to everyone thank you namaste namaste good night